mentioning, as you were saying earlier, uh, yesterday we were looking at the simple network, network application, simple client-server client application. Right? We saw that how to create a simple client application and also the simple uh, server application. The main thing to, to look at that, the sample code, is to understand the, the few socket a few socket functions, right? So on the on the client side, there were first step we do is to create a socket. Right? There's a function called socket. Create a socket, and then we initialize the values in the structure. Right? We put in the IP address of the server, the port address. And then later, what we do, we try to connect the socket, the client socket to the server. If everything is okay, then we wait for the reply from the server. Right? If we get a reply, we read the reply from the socket and then we display on the screen. Right? That's, what, that's what we did yesterday. On the server side, same thing, the server will create a socket and then it will attach its own IP address, its own port number onto the structure and then it will bind it, it will, it will attach the two together and then the server will wait for incoming client connections. So how does it do that? It uses a listen, it use a listen function. Right? It starts a listening mode. By running the listen function, the server will basically listen for incoming client connections. So if the, if the client connection comes in, then it will accept the client connection and that means now there is a a socket connected directly between the client and the server. So then the server can actually send a message to the client via the socket. Right? So the server will write a message to the socket which the client can read from the socket and so on. That's what we saw yesterday. So that's basically the whole or, that's, or rather that's basically the skeleton of a simple client server application. So any other client server application which we'll look at later on all will follow the same principles we will have the same skeleton. Only thing, the functionality will be, might be slightly different. But these are the, these are the important functions which you, has to, which you have to familiarize yourself. Right? right, today what we're going to do is that we're going to take a look at some of the, the, the work which is going on below the socket layer. Right? We saw that yesterday, socket layer is normally is at the boundary between the application layer and the transport layer of the TCP-IP model. Right? So we're going to take a look at how the socket actually handles the TCP-IP model, the uh, TCP-IP layer. So before we go into further, let's a little bit of, of, of revision of, of the UDP and TCP. Right? As you know that the transport layer has two protocols, the UDP and the TCP. Right? The UDP protocol is the one which is called connectionless. It's normally very, very simple. It doesn't do much. You just send the data out on the UDP packet, and that's it, and hope for the best. So it's simple, unreliable, no error control, no flow control. Right? It does not try to connect. It does not even see. It does not even try to see whether there's a server out there. Right? If there's an error, it does not detect for errors, congestion, nothing. Right? Very simple. And the other one is the, the TCP. Right? So TCP gives you higher level of service. So in this case, we call it the connection oriented. Means that it is reliable, robust, error control, flow control, full duplex, and sophisticated. Right? What it means is that before the TCP tries to connect to the other side, it must check whether the server exists or not. Right? So if the client is using TCP socket to connect to the server, then the client will need to check whether the server exists. If there's no such server, then you cannot connect. You the socket will not even be created. You, you cannot connect to it. Right? And then that's it. Over time, it will also try to do error control between it, uh, congestion, flow control, and all that. Make sure that the messages exchanged between the client and the server uh, can be handled by the other side. It does not overflow, for example. Right? So all these things will be handled by TCP. So in our course, most of the sockets which we create will be TCP sockets. Right, so there will be automatic uh, error control, flow control, reliability will be incorporated into it. But we will also try, there's also an example where we try to do UDP sockets, right, to see the comparison between 
when you, you do a UDP uh, based uh, client server application, what happens compared to a TCP based client server application? Uh, later we will do, we'll do that. But most of the time, we are using the TCP one, right? So this diagram from a book basically gives us an uh, overview of the protocols. Again, uh, we don't want to go into, into detail of this. Right? So what this diagram says that there are many, many protocols up here. Right? The, the one which we have TCP and UDP. There's also another one, SCTP, which we are not going to do that. That's more for stream uh, control or stream uh, where, where the data is coming in streaming mode. So we're going to do UDP and TCP. And related to them, there are all these uh, this IPv4 version, IPv6 version. So both of them can go UDP or TCP. And there's also ICMP, IGMP, ARP, and all these things. Right? We'll look at some of them, not in detail, but just as, as your general knowledge. Right? So if you remember this, the diagram, right? Up here, there's the layers. So TCP is basically layer four, right? Transport layer. Either it goes uh, UDP, uh, UDP or TCP. So the socket, if you remember, it was here. Right? We create a socket, socket above layer four, right? The user part of it. Uh, so the socket is the one which, so when you create a socket, you need, you need to identify, you need to create a socket using UDP or TCP. Then it will start using the services below it. Right, so these are some of the protocols. Uh, so IPv4, as we said earlier, version 4, IPv6, version 6, TCP, UDP. And there are a few other uh, protocols which you will come across. Uh, we are not going to use them in this course, but it's just for your general knowledge. Right, so ICMP is normally used by uh, hosts and routers. So when you forward the packet from one host to one router to another router, if the router is not found, then you will say router error. Right? So you will send, a back, send back an ICMP packet saying that the router cannot be found or cannot, the, fo the packet cannot be forwarded due to some reason. Right? It's basically for error control. Then we have uh, IGMP protocol. It's more for multicasting. Then we have the ARP. So if you look at the, the ICMP, it's normally in layer three, network layer. right? And the ARP and the RARP is normally layer 3. So ARP, what it does is that it will convert the IP address to the MAC address, right? The media access control. MAC address is normally layer 2, if you remember from last time, right? IP address is layer 3, network layer. MAC address is layer 2, the data link layer. Right? So basically, it's that a packet will come to a machine, right? So the, the layer 3 will look at the IP address and see whether the packet belongs to it, right? But when it send out, sends out the packet, it's based on IP address. So when the packet is circulating on the local network, local network is normally connected to a, a networking protocol, either it's Ethernet or something else. So those things work on them basically on the layer two, right? So before a packet can be delivered to a, a particular machine on the local network, it, the IP address has to be converted to a, a MAC address, a physical address. So how does it convert? It basically makes use of another protocol, ARP. Right? We're not going into the details of that right, because it's not related to our, our socket programming. Yeah. But it's just about your knowledge. Then of course, it's the other way around. You have a MAC address, you want to find the IP address. That, that also is a, it's another protocol called reverse ARP. Right? Just basically, that means you, if you have this particular machine, I know the IP address, I want to know what is the MAC address, I can use an ARP packet. I can send an ARP packet, the machine will reply and, give, and convert for me and give me back the MAC address. Right. Right, so it's basically, that, for example, I know, the, I know that the IP number is somewhere in this, in this room. Right? But when I forward the packet, it's the layer two which will forward the packet to the next link. So to, for layer two to follow the packet, it requires the MAC address. So you will send a message, okay. You will send, a, you will send an ARP packet around and say, okay, who's, who's, whoever has this IP address, 
please give me your MAC address. So I ask, the owner of this IP address, give me your MAC address. So that, that machine will reply. So now I know what is the MAC address, then my layer 2 will be able to send the, my data directly to the layer 2 of that particular machine. That's what how you used. Then we have the ICMP version 6, so this is similar to the ICMP version 4. Right? And of course we have the BPF and DLP again, which, is, which we are not going to look at. Right? Now this is from the chapter 1, right? the, basically the same uh, code. So as mentioned earlier, there are a few, few important functions here, the socket function to create a socket. This is basically initializing and, in, and inserting the values. Then we use a connect function. And then after that, if connect is successful, then we can start reading from the socket. That's from the client side. The server side, we create a socket. Again, we, we insert the, uh, the IP address, the port number and so on. We bind it. Then we start listening for incoming connections from the client. Right? And once a con connection client comes in, we accept the client connection then we can start corresponding with the client on the socket itself. Right? So we can start writing and reading to the socket so that we, whatever packet we read and write on the socket will be delivered to the other side. After that, normally we, we close the connection. All right? So what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, look today is basically the, what happens when you call socket or when you call connect or listen, accept and all that. Right? What actually happened at the, at the TCP layer? So, first part, as we know that TCP connections, if you remember from last time, it has three phases. Right? Before we can do a TCP connection between client and server, it goes through three, three phases. Right? The connection establishment, the handshaking. Right? Before you can send data, there's handshaking involved. After that, the data transfer phase, then you can start trans transferring data. At the end, you, connect, you disconnect. Right? So there are three, three Phases. So, what we're going to do there is see which socket function is related to which, which phase. So, when we do a socket function, so the client and the server is corresponding. So, client in the client program, it starts a, uh, the socket function, right? It creates a socket. So, creating socket does not involve any interaction with the server, nothing. So, when the client creates a socket here, it just creates a, a number, an identifier. That's all. There's no connection to the server yet. Same thing on the server side. When the server creates its own socket, again, there's no connection to the client yet. On the server side, when it binds the socket to its address, again, no connection to the client yet. All right? Only, the only collection of client will come in later with the listen and accept. Right? So that's what the diagram is showing you. So on the client side, when you run the socket function, nothing happens. It creates, but there's no connection yet. No, co no correspondence with the server yet. On the server side, we create a socket, we bind and listen. Okay, now, after the socket has been created on the client, then we call connect right, on the client side. Now, once the connect runs, the connect function, what it will do, it will start the handshake sequence between the client and the server. Right? So the, once the connect starts, it will, so handshake uh, sequence basically involves the, the three-way handshake. You remember, from this, remember this from last time? You send a SYN packet to the other side, then the other side will reply with the SYN, synchronization packet, plus acknowledgement, and then you send your another acknowledgement. So once these three packets has been exchanged, means that connection has been established between the client and the server. Right? So the connect function on the client will initiate this handshaking. So the moment it runs connect, it will send a SYN, then it wait for response, acknowledgement and a SYN. Once the SYN comes back, now you know that the server has replied and is ready to accept the connect function from the client. So now the, the connect actually is returned. So what happens is that there is a delay between when the connect is called and when the value of the connect is returned. Right? So this delay is basically 
in here. If you look at the code, disconnect here. You call the connect function, you have to wait for some time, like line 17. If you call the connect function, you have to wait some time before the value is returned by the function. Right? So, so you call the connect function, there will be some time, a little delay until the connect function returns you a value. If the return value is more than zero, that means the connection is successful. It means that handshaking is successful and it just say that the server is ready to accept your connection. Right? So it's not immediate in other words. So this is what is being described by the, the diagram here. It's not immediate. If your server is far away or having congestion, it might take longer or it might be immediate. But there's always, it's not uh, it's not uh, straight away, right? There's a certain delay involved because there's a handshaking involved. Yeah. On, the server, on the server side, after you run the socket, the bind, only after start, the, listen, the listen has been on, that means the listen function has been executed, now the server is ready to receive connections from the client. Right? That means once the listen is running, then the server is ready to receive the handshake from the client. Right? So once the handshake comes, then it will accept accept the, uh, the handshake from the client and then it will wait until it receives the confirmation from the client. After three, three, the three-way exchange is actually completed. Once it receives the acknowledgement from the client, only then the accept will return a value. It means that only that accept will be successful. So if we go back again to the program, if you look at the code for the server, right? Listen, in, in line 16, it says listen. So that means now the server is ready, waiting for connections, or rather waiting for handshakes to come from the client, right? And then when it comes, then it will accept. And the value returned is, after the accept is successful, that means the handshake is completed, only then it will return a value. That will be the new the socket. Right? So this is what it means. After that, only accept, then it returns. Only then, after that, the server can read and write to the data to the socket itself. Means that on the client side, after the connect returns, on the server side, after the accept returns, then only the connection is open for communication between the client and the server. Before that, not ready yet. Right? So during this handshaking procedure, there are normally it's default values which is being exchanged between the client and server. But uh, so the default value is basically three back three options there: MSS, Windows Scale, and the timestamp. Right. So when the SYN packets are sent between the client and server, so the MSS, the maximum segment size can also be changed if you want to. But default value is 512 bytes. What it says that whoever is sending the SYN packet saying that I'm going to send you data in 512 bytes, uh, blocks. So if the client starts the handshaking, I start the handshaking with you, means that I'm going to say, okay, after, after shaking the hand, I'm going to tell you, while shaking hand, I'll tell you that I'm going to send you data in a maximum of 512 bytes in one block. Right. So this is basically the TCP size. Right, so this MSS is basically the size of the TCP block. So the default is normally 512. You can change it later if you want to, right? but it doesn't matter. Second thing is that during the SYN packet, the, the client will also inform the other side. What is the size of my windows, my sliding window? Remember the sliding window last time? Right? Sliding window is basically to say how many packets I can send, uh, I'm, I'm ready to send to you. So again, there's a maximum of 65,000 bytes, which you can send. Of course, this is what you can send, but how much you can send once is only this, MSS. So the, the, the sliding window basically says that these are the packets, or these are the bytes which I'm, I can send to you, but in the meantime, I only send you 512 bytes first. 512, 512, 512. Right. And third one will be timestamp, right? So each time they change, change each time they make handshake, 
they will actually also exchange time. Say, this is my time, that is your time. So then packets come after that, you know that these packets were already has been uh, approved earlier. We already handshake on it. The packets come after that, it's the one which you are expecting. Right? Not lost packets or old packets or whatever it is. Right? So there are three, three information which is being exchanged between the client and the server during the handshaking process by the TCP header itself. Right? So normally we don't do much, it's the TCP takes care of it by itself. Then at the end, once we are done exchanging data, then we want to terminate the connection. Uh, so how we terminate connection? We have the, the close command, right? close socket. If we go, go back again to the, our code, in the, in the server side, you will see at the end, line 22, it says close the socket uh, here. All right? That means we are finished. The server is finished sending data to the client. You say, okay, now I terminate the connection. All right? So what does the close socket does? Again, if you remember last time from TCP communication, right? so when it says close means it's going to send a packet called fin, finish. So when you send a packet, client will send a packet, whoever, whoever starts the close will send a fin packet to the other side and the server will reply with the acknowledgement. Okay, say I, I accept your finish. You want to close? Okay, I accept. Right? But at the same time, server will say, okay, since you want to close, I also want to close. So server will also send a fin packet and this packet will be acknowledged. After that, once the, these four packets are exchanged, the socket between the client and the server no longer exists. It's no longer active anymore. Right? So if you, if you write, after that, if you try to write a message to the socket, it will give you error because the socket is no longer active or try to read a value from the socket, it will give you error because the socket is no longer connected anymore. Right? Right, so this is basically what it is. So this is what's going on behind the scenes by the TCP layer for your socket functions, especially the connect, and accept, and also the close. So this diagram gives you the summary of what's going on. Right, again, same thing, socket, connect, so once the three-way three handshake is completed, then the connection is established. Now the client and server can actually start sending data between one another. All right? You can start writing to the socket, can start reading it. Again, the server can read and write at the same time. All right? At the end, they will close the connection one by one. All right? So there are basically three phases. The handshaking, the data transfer, and then at the bottom is the the close. Now we came a little bit of this yesterday about the port numbers. Right? So, let, so let's go back again uh, the, the, the establishment of port numbers. So port numbers, as you know, they are 16 bits. Right? So what is a port number? Anybody still remember what is it? What is it used for? What's a port number used for? Identify what? Identify a machine, identify a, a service, right? So identify application, for example. So one machine running multiple applications, services, each service will be identified by a unique port number. Because the same machine will have, a, one machine will have the same IP number, but when, when you run multiple applications on the same machine, they must have a different ID, which is a port number, right? So the port number identifies a service or application running on a particular machine. Right? So the port number seen is 16 bits, so the values go from 0 to 65,535. Right? That's the maximum range. But in port numbers, the, there, is a, there is an international body right, which, has, which has categorized the port numbers into three different phases or three different categories. We call them well-known ports, registered ports and also the dynamic ports. So the well-known ports is the one which runs from 0 to 1023. These are the port numbers which has been fixed by the IANA. Means that this is fixed number, fixed services associated with a port number. So for example like this, the table given here, 
port number 80 is fixed for HTTP for web browsing. Right. So if you want to use for web browsing, we always use, if you want to create a, a client server application for web browsing, then we should use port 80 for that purpose. Don't use some other number because it's not standardized. So we want to standardize all these services. Right. Yesterday, we were using uh, port 13, remember, for daytime. So that port number 13 has been fixed as a daytime service. So we shouldn't change it. Right? So well-known port addresses are normally fixed in that, in that way, to so standardize the services across all. But if you want to run your own service, right, then you can create, you can, then you use a, one of the ports from between 1024 to about 49,151, right? So then you can create any other service. You create a, a sample client server application, which you want to just try and error, okay? Then we use a port number between this range. Now this number will not interfere with the register numbers because this port number is now our own, right? It's not, it's not a standard port number for fixed service. So therefore we can use one of them. And there's also called a dynamic port numbers. Dynamic port numbers is normally used by the client to connect to the server. Remember yesterday, or rather, if you look at this, go back. Uh, now, again, the, 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 the code, the client is trying to connect to the server, right? So we know that the server is running at port 13. Okay, fine. Right? Uh, what is the port number for the client? Did we fix the port number for client? No, right? We didn't. We only fixed the port number for the server. Because the server must, be, must run a service. Port number for client will be automatically assigned when he sends the packet. So what, what port number is assigned to the client will be the dynamic port number. All right, so this is the one between or rather after 49,152. So one client connects to a server. So the client will be given one port number. After the connection is over, that port, that port number is reused for again later on. It's not, it's not attached in other words. Right? So it's only temporary in other words. This is only temporary or we call it ephemeral ports. Right? So it's normally on, used on the client side. Later we will see, see the examples of, of, where, of, of how to look at this. So coming back to the sockets. So the socket is very important in a sense in, in terms of IP number and the port number itself. Right? So the socket pair, remember each time we create a socket connection, there must be a pair, there must be a client and a server. So the socket will connect the client to the server. Right? So on the client side, you will have the IP address and the port number. On the server side, you also have a IP number and the port number. Right? So, so this connection is basically what we call as a socket pair. Right? So uniquely, so the socket pair uniquely identifies every TCP connection. So every TCP connection is basically one socket pair. It consists of local IP address, local port number, foreign IP address and foreign port number. So in our case, it will be a client IP address and client port number on one side, server IP address and server port number on the other side. So the combination of a, of a port, of an IP number and port number is the socket ID. Right? So these two are combined to give a unique socket ID for each uh, connection. Now, so this example here, so TCP server, right? So this is how we indicate, so we are running a server at port 21, right? So this is the IP number, two, two IP numbers assigned to this particular server, right? So the server will run, so we use this, this, this particular uh, description of how to, how to represent the server, right? The brackets, in the brackets, the first one is asterisk 21, Second one is asterisk dot asterisk. Right, so the first one refers to our local IP address. So if we go back to here, you refer to this. Local IP address, local port number, foreign IP address, 
foreign part number, foreign port number in that sequence. So the so the asterisk twenty one basically refers that is so that this particular server the local port number is twenty one. That means this server is running on port twenty one. So twenty one is fixed. Port number is fixed. But the IP number for the for the server is not fixed. You will take whatever assigned to it. So that's why you put the asterisk. Right. So that means any data coming to these two, you, you can any any data coming in to these two IP numbers, it will accept. Right. So if we go back to the code yesterday, if you remember, on the server, what IP address we assign? We use this. We use a special constant uh, in address any. This means this is basically a strict. It means that any IP number which is allocated to the to the server, we will take it. Uh, we are not uh, we are not fixing what the IP number should be. We just take whatever uh, is allocated to it. So in our diagram here, in our in our representation for socket, we put it asterisk. Right? So the important thing for server is that it must run on port twenty one. That's that's fixed. And then, what are the IP number and port number for the other side? So this server runs on any 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 IP number assigned to it, but must be port twenty one. But which but what, what clients can it connect to? Which clients can it connect to? So the asterisk dot asterisk means that any client, any client with a, a client with any IP number and a client with any port address. So we're not restricting the port numbers of the client. So clients can come say client coming from port uh, 50,000. Okay, 50,001, fine, no problem. Right, so we're not fixing any port numbers for the client, right? Because it will use dynamic port numbers anyway. So that's what it means. So local port, local address not specified, can receive connections from any network address, foreign address and port number not specified. Right? So basically, what it means, to, if you have like this, it means that it is in listening mode. It's willing to accept connections from any client coming in. Right? It's, it's just basically listened. Anyone, any client want to connect to it is ready. That's what it means. Right? That's how a server should be. So now we have one client. So this is our server, right? Now a client is trying to connect. A particular client is trying to connect to the server. Okay, fine. This particular client has an IP number, right? Two zero six something. And so when this client tries to connect, so if you look at the socket pair on the on the client side, you look at here is so the first the first is basically a, a a pair, right? The pair says the IP number, local IP number, local port number, foreign IP number, foreign port number. So the client's local IP number will be the one which is the client IP number, right? Which is this. Then the, the port number for the for the client will be dynamic. So in this case, it's one thousand five. Actually, it's wrong. It should it shouldn't be. It should be more than forty nine thousand. If you look back the, the previous assignment, right? So anyway, so it's one thousand five hundred, right? So this is our the socket for the client side. IP number, port number. Now this client wants to connect to who? He wants needs to connect to a server with the this particular IP number, the 12.106, and the server's IP number is 21. Oh, sorry, the server's port number is 21. Right? Okay, so we'll go back here again. <clears throat> right, so now we have a specific connection from one client to this server. Right? So the, the connection is coming in. From 206, IP number and port 150. Right? So now this will go to here. So this connection will coming in from here. So once this connection comes in, what the server has to do? The server has to accept the socket, attach the socket, uh, or rather create a socket. Oh, sorry, it will try to connect the socket with the server. Make the socket two way now. Right? So what it does is that 
it will create a socket now. If you look at the, the bottom diagram, at the bottom part, so now the local, the, the first part again, we have local IP address and the port number, foreign IP address and port number. Right? This, this is a socket pair. So now earlier it was asterisk 21, asterisk, asterisk. So now there's a specific connection coming in from the client. So the, the socket pair has changed now. The, there's a value assigned to it now. No longer it is uh, asterisk anymore. Right? So the server's IP number, what, what server IP number should use now? Because the client is requesting connection to 12.10632. So since the server has two IP addresses, the socket is com the, the connection is coming to the IP address called 12106. So therefore the server will assign the local IP address as 12.10632254. Right? And then its local Port number is still the same, 21. That cannot be changed because it's running a service at 21. Now, the server's foreign port number, which, so this server is now connected to which client? So, it depends on the client's IP address. So, client's IP address and client's port number, right? So, you look at the second part of the, of the connection. So, the foreign IP address and foreign port number for the server is 206, 168, 112, 219, and the port number is 1500. So now you look at the bottom part here, our socket is actually has the full values. Local IP number, local port number, it has fixed values. Foreign port number, a uh, foreign IP number, foreign IP address and foreign port number also has fixed values. Right? So that means now this socket is directly connected between that client and that server. And on that port on the client and on that port on the server. Understand? Right? So it's very, very specific now. From earlier part, asterisk 21, asterisk, asterisk, means it's not connected to anyone yet. It's listening mode. So once the connection comes in, then the values will be assigned to the socket. And now we have a fixed socket connection between the client and the server. So this is what it means. So now the, the second diagram shows the, the client and the server is connected via dedicated socket now. However, the server has still another version of it running the listening mode. So the earlier part still remains. So what it, what it does is that once a, a client connection comes from the server, the server will make a copy of it. It will duplicate itself. The earlier part will remain in listening mode and the second part is the one which will make connection with the, with the client. So in other words, there are two copies of the server running. So we call this the, the ch server child. There is a, a, a concurrent server now. Uh, we will look at this example, how to, how to do it later on. Uh, so basically what it says is that uh, the server makes another copy of itself, and this copy is the one which is connected to the client. The original server is still running listening mode for new connections to come in. Uh, so the next diagram shows that. If another, connect, if another client now connect, try to connect to the server, again, the server will repeat the same process. It will create a copy of itself, create a child process of itself, right? assign the values of the, 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 values of the, the foreign IP and the foreign uh, port number, and you, that will establish a direct connection between this server and the second client. Right? So the values of the of the IP number and the port number is now has been confirmed. Right? Again, the server still is running in listening mode looking for new connections to come in. Right? So it's very important you understand this concept right? because this is how the server works. Right? So in other words, only, the, only once the socket is connected means that its local IP address, local port number, foreign IP address, foreign port number, once those values has been assigned, then the socket is connected between that client and that server, right? For that particular ports only. So if you look at this, the second client comes in from the same IP number, same IP address, but the port number is now different. Earlier is 1500, now it's 1501. 
right? So now when the server connects, it creates a separate uh, socket connection. It's connected to a different port number now. Right? As long as the, the combination of the IP number and port number is different between local and foreign, then we are okay. That's unique connection. All right, next we can look at, again, a little bit of TCP too, right? So what's going on again? What's going on in the TCP itself uh, in terms of uh, data transfer? Earlier we saw that during the synchronization or handshaking procedure, we have one value which we can play around, right? The MSS, maximum segment size. That means when you handshake between client and server, the client will indicate to the server, okay, this is my packet size coming in this much. I'm going to send you data maximum this size. Right? That's what MSS is. But that's at the TCP level. That's layer four, transport layer. But transport layer cannot deliver data on its own. Transport layer has to depend on the service of the layer three, right? Below, network layer. Transport layer will pass the data, what you get from the user, and say, okay, ask the layer three, you send it. Correct? Layer three, what well, layer three is basically the network layer. So network layer will have its own, depending on which network it uses, whether you're using Ethernet, point-to-point uh, -point connection, IPv4, IPv6, whichever version it is, then it, it will have its own data size to send. Right? So this is where MTU comes in. So MTU is basically the maximum transmission unit size depending on the network technology you use. So depending on which network do you use. Some network will have high MTU, some network will have a small MTU. Right? So that's the carrying capacity of the network itself. So it's basically this. Um, Maybe I should, sh I should draw a diagram. All right, let's see this. So you have a client. You have the server, right? After our, our connections has been, our socket has been created. So we have a socket here. We have a socket here, right? Socket is connected now. So now the user is here. So user sends data. The data is supposed to travel here and which will be read by the server or the other way around. Right? So now the user sends data, a message. Right? This message has to be passed on to the socket. Correct? So this message will go to the socket. Socket is basically TCP. Right? So the TCP layer will do and say, okay, what is my MSSS? You send me this much of block of data. Let's say I send 500 bytes. Right? But the MSS of TCP is 512. Okay, okay this should be 500. Let, let's make it more. Let's make it 800, right? The user will send data 800 bytes, block 800 bytes, but the TCP's MSS is 512 bytes, right? So what it means is that this block, you cannot simply chunk and say, okay, TCP, I, TCP cannot send it in one block together. So now it has to break it up, right? So, so if you look at the, with these layers we will have, this is your application layer, your transport layer, network, and then your uh, physical layer. This is the, the TCP IP. So here we have a block size of 500, uh, sorry, 800. TCP say it only can accept until 512. The socket is here, remember? That's where the socket is. This goes down. Right, so user sends 800 bytes of data to the socket, and then the socket is a TCP socket. The socket will say, okay, I can use 800, I have to break it up into 500, 
and uh, and the remaining will be left over. That will be about two hundred and eighty-eight. All right. Now, the transport layer will pass on to the network layer. Network layer, let's say you're running Ethernet, for example. Right, so Ethernet might have its own standard. For example, okay, we use a simple one. So Ethernet, let's say we use, uh, so this is MSS. MSS is here. But the network's MTU will be here, network layer. So network layer, let's say the MTU, it can only accept data up to 400. So network layer can only accept, it can only create network packets of the size 400 bytes. So that means now, the one coming here has to be broken up. So now, the network layer will break up this 512 into 400 plus 112 and then 280 is fine because it's, it's still within the limits. Right. Then it will send. Put, put, uh, of course, it will put the, the header and all these things, and IP address and all. Then, then send it out. So what it means is that. So what MTU basically says that what are the. What is the size of the packet network packet. That can actually transfer your data. In other words, how much bytes you can transfer in one go. So that will depend on the, network you you're using. So again, if you look at this diagram, the MSS is basically here. This is TCP coming from TCP layer. The MSS is this size plus a header. Once you go to the network layer, network layer, that means this is the one. You go network layer, then this is the whole thing is, is that comes the data. And then you put the IP header. So this will be the MTU size. So normally is that the MTU is bigger than MSS normally, right? But the main, main thing is that it has to break it up, in other words, right? So this is where the fragmentation and reassembly comes in, right? So this is called fragmentation. We have to break up the original data into multiple blocks. That's fragmentation. And then on, on, the, on the other side, this is, this is on the sending side, on the sender. On the receiver side, it has to be reassembled until it com gets complete 800 bytes, then only will be given to the user. Right, so it, the process works in reverse. Right, so example, example given here again. Right, so, bit, so let's say we are sending, so let's say uh, the MTU of, so if the data is going from one host to another host and goes through multiple routers in between, the, the, the MTU might be different for different links because they could be different, different networks, different lengths. Right, so for the MTU here is 1,500, but here between the first router and second router is only 500. So if the first packet is sent is 1,005, this packet once you go to router 1, you will notice that oh, the next link is only a set MTU of 500, maximum size of 500. So it will break up 1,005 into three blocks and then send them. And then after that, the next router, the MTU, is only 100. Right? Is it 100? No, sorry, 300. Right? So the MTU for the next, between R2 and the host is 300. So now each 500 block coming in, has to break up into 300, 200. Next 500, 300, 200, 500, becomes 300 and 200. So in the end, you, one big packet becomes six small packets. So this fragmentation, right? So this fragmentation happens from hop to hop as the, as the data goes from one router or one host to another host, right? So this is what I mean. So there's a path MTU normally, right? So the smallest MTU, path MTU is basically the smallest MTU size along the path of two hosts. So in this case, between this host and this host, from this source to this destination, the smallest is basically 300. 
right? So normally we don't know, right? It's because you have a source here, you send data. What it does, it will check with the R1. We check the next one, and during the handshaking, it will, it will already find out what is the the size of the MTU itself. Then use that accordingly, right? So this one basically says that so sometimes the the MTU size between sending and receiving might be different, may not be not necessarily be the same, right? For example, in this case, it means this way to this way is 1,005, but in reverse, when go back from R1 to H1, may not necessarily be the same. They might have different values for different links. Right, so if IPv4 datagrams, normally, if it's bigger than the path MTU size, then the host or the router will perform the fragmentation, as shown here. So the problem is that you will get a lot of fragmentation along the way. In IPv6, is that the routers will not perform the fragmentation. Only the host will do. So in this case, IPv6, what it will do, it will try to find out what is the, what is the path MTU from the go to host, H1 to H2. It will send, a, send a some, some, some test packet all the way and find out what is the lowest value first. Lowest value is 300. And then it will start, at the host level, it will start sending data in 300, 300, 300 blocks. So that when it comes to the router in between, all can go without any fragmentation. Right? So that's IPv6 will do that way. IPv4 normally just takes the data, you just send, and then, and then see whether it has to be fragmented. And then it goes to the next, next router. It's the responsibility of the next router to divide again, if, if necessary. But IPv6 is trying to do at once, at the beginning. Whatever it is, the reassembly is only done at the final destination. Right? So for example, sending, sending, sending all this, only the, only the host will do the reassembly. Right? Has to take all these packets together. And normally in the proper sequence again. You don't jump, you jumble them up, it will be wrong. Right? So it has to be in proper sequence. And of course, there is sometimes you can set a special flag called a don't fragment. That means I'm sending this particular packet, I say, I, this flag, I say don't fragment. It means that this packet I send, don't break it up. Either you send it full or you don't send. So then the network layer will look at it. If, this, if the size of the packet is bigger than MTU, you will just drop it, you won't, you won't forward, you won't forward, right? Because you, you insist, right? So this is normally to, to make things faster, right? So again, we don't, we don't worry much about MTU, but again, if you are doing client-side application, you want to improve things, then you might want to play around with these MSS figures, or MTU figures, and then there's a possibility for you to do that. Uh, we will take a look at later. We'll see how the sockets actually you can manipulate the sockets to actually uh, override these values. Right? There is control available in the sockets to make use of this facility. But normally we don't we don't touch them because it gets messy. So again, this is the same example we've shown here, right? So the application buffer size can be any size, right? Again. This buffer size is the same thing here, right? If you go back to our, our example, the server, right? The server is what the server sends message to the client. What's the, what's the message sent by the server to the client? The time. Remember, the server sends a current time and date to the client, isn't it? So it prepares the current time and date into a proper format and then put the data into the buffer and then write the buffer onto the, to the socket. So the question, this is the buffer we are, so the socket, so this application only sending the size of this buffer to the socket, right? That's the application layer control. Right, so this is what it is. The application layer, you prepare your message and then you write to the socket. Then when the socket try to send, then it will start using, start looking at this configuration. What is the sender buffer size? What is the MSS? What is the MTU? And so on. Before you can actually send. So you look at, 
So at TCP level, you will break up data into MSS sized segments and then go to IP layer, once passed to IP layer, IP layer will break it up into, into a size which is compatible with. And then only data will be sent out. Right? So TCP does, does all that. This one just says that if UDP then, remember UDP has no reliability, no error control, no flow control. Right? So data, whatever is sent by the buffer, it was tried straight away try to send directly to the IP. So it doesn't check whether it can fit or not. That's not, that's not the responsibility of the UDP. So take a buffer, you send it out. It's your, your luck. If the MTU is large enough, it, it accept, not means your problem. Right? Data get lost, not delivered, it's not my, my, it's not my, my issue. Right? So UDP does not guarantee all, all those things. So of course UDP will be faster because it doesn't go through all the details, but it's not reliable in that sense. Okay, so you leave it, it does not break it up and all that, you just leave it to the IP, IP layer and then IP layer, let, let, let IP layer handle it, break it up and whatever it is. Right, this again uh, show you the common, uh, common uh, ports and the services associated with it. So so we have been using the so far we're using number 13 for our daytime. Right? There's another one, 37, 7, 9, and all these things, which might be, we might be using later. But basically is that each of them you can either use port TCP port or you can use UDP port. So in other words, you can run the same service using UDP or TCP. Right? For example, the the, the time the daytime client, daytime server. We can either use TCP or you can use UDP. It's allowed. Right? But some services are quite fixed normally. So if you look at this diagram, again, same thing tells you what are the applications and uh, what transport and what service does it use, whether you use UDP or TCP. Right? So quick quick like look at this. So you look at this somewhere here, HTTP, web. So web services, is, is, is for web services, it is compulsory to use TCP sockets, right? So you say web services, browsing cannot be done in UDP, right? So you must require TCP. So this fix. So HTTP, Telnet, SSH, right? Logging and all these things. Uh, what do we have first? We have FTP, file transfer, telnet, email also SMTP. So all these things are using TCP because they require reliable service. You cannot send a message out. You cannot send an email if you do not know where the where this email server is. Right? So you must use a TCP. But for others, for example, like routing protocols, right? OSPF, RIP, BGP. Some of them allows you UDP, some of them says that it must be TCP. Which socket to use? Some of them, like DNS, NFS, right? And, uh, looking for the domain name lookup and all these things, they can, can do either UDP or TCP. Right? It works in both. And other things also. All right? So basically it just tells you, it shows you that a particular socket type, either you, whether you need UDP or TCP, it depends. For some services, it's fixed. You have to use a particular one. For some, that's a choice. Then you make a choice. Right? But if it's fixed, then you have no choice. So that also it depends on the reliability of the particular service you're doing. Okay? Okay, no, that's it.